It seems like there comes a time in every YouTuber's life where they do this, where they make the expensive nerd pilgrimage to glorious Nippon, testing a lifetime's worth of pop culture promises. I climbed Mount Fuji, I went to the Capcom bar, I found porn literally everywhere. But why go outside and do fun things in Japan when you could stay in dark rooms and play video games the whole time? Japan is a nation of trains. Japanese people really freaking love their trains. And when you look at how trains intersect with and contribute to the strength of their economy, you can start to understand why. Trains and train stations are everywhere, to the point where if you overlaid the maps for all the different rail lines that service Tokyo, you'd have a map with almost as many intersections and transportation arteries as an actual road map of Tokyo. This creates cities with incredibly walkable layouts where what would be dingy neglected back alleys in any other part of the world are fully developed mixed-use streets in any big city of Japan, trafficked by a majority of pedestrians rather than vehicles. Combine that with the cash-based economy that issues really high-value coins. Seriously, this 500 yen coin is worth like four and a half bucks. You can actually buy a lot with just this one coin. And you have thousands of small independent retail businesses catering to all that foot traffic jingling around all that expendable chump change. And thus, you have vending machines everywhere and convenience stores that have actually good food. And my theory behind why Japan is one of the last places on earth where coin-op arcades are still a bustling business. To the point where a grocery store in Hiroshima 500 miles away from Tokyo has an entire basement level that's just an arcade. But paying the rent and overhead cost of dense Japanese retail space means having to appeal to ordinary people, and right now, ordinary people seem to really like prize grabbers. Oppressively rigged prize grabbers, where any contribution you make to the system is a mere implication that you're trying to grab the prize rather than an actual attempt to grab the prize. No, no, oh. Close, but I digress. Walk past the prize grabbers and soon you'll find an arcade for weirdos like us. An arcade where the Technicolor dream of the cyberpunk 80s is still alive, where a kid can walk in with a pocket full of coins and leave with a dream and not much else, really. Believe it or not, arcade games have microtransactions, really long tutorials, and progression tracking mechanics now. I love U-Beat. I first encountered it at a con in America, and it's still all over the arcades in Japan. It's a brilliant little rhythm game where the issue of syncing your hands on a controller with a stupidly fast lineup of on-screen button prompts is solved by making the screen your controller. A diverse demographic of Japanese gamers really love these music games. They were consistently the most crowded rooms outside of prize grabbers, but they've always been a bit too manic for me. Except for U-Beat. U-Beat rocks. But it makes you play through a dumb 40 second tutorial with every play. Unless you buy Konami's stupid little $5 e-amusement card and register that to an online account. You'll see emblems and meters pop up and shrink away and fill the screen with ads for this card instead. Similar incentives to buy beyond the coin also exist in examples of what is the new hotness. These multiplayer team battle arenas where players circle strafe around Z-targeted opponents, oftentimes through the internet. Dissidia Final Fantasy, Mobile Suit Gundam VS, even Pokin all show the same kind of camera work and control scheme. And it was a little anticlimactic seeing these wacky Japanese arcades so full of games that play with just regular ordinary controllers even if they tape move lists onto the machines. But that's okay, since this game type is the same type that's found on the biggest, wackiest machines that have formed the iconic representation of a Japanese arcade in the West. Gunslinger Stratos merges light gun shooter with third person shooter by tacking a couple analog sticks onto those guns. But it goes further. Boy, does it go further. You got a double jump, you can chain in and out of an air dash and sometimes a wall run, but the real gimmick is that slapping those two guns together transforms them in-game into entirely new guns. Stack them vertically and you might make a rocket launcher. Stack them horizontally and you might get a machine gun. I've always been a sucker for controller gimmicks, and this stuff just takes the cake. You are striking poses here that make anime real. You are reifying the bombastic flashiness of what's happening on the screen in a way that just feels good. You're also juggling around special meters that you can spend in two different ways against destructible environments with character-specific abilities and team combos for a multiplayer deathmatch, if you have the card. It's bots only otherwise. It's complicated enough that the 10 to 15 minute tutorial can take up a whole coin's worth of play, and that prospect plus all the card hustling going on is something that I would find offensive if the value of a single coin's worth of play was not pretty alright. And that's really the deciding factor that makes these Japanese arcades so much more appealing to me than the western barcade concept that's trying to replicate it, it's that it is cheap. 
A and Japan has no public drinking laws, so you can go down to the convenience store, get a beer, guzzle it on the way to the arcade, and you will have a good, fun, cheap night of entertainment, and I won't judge you. The vast majority of machines just want one of these 100 yen coins to have a go, and that'll last you like 5 to 10 minutes, which is really the bare minimum that they're on offer here. Of course, the money to time ratio changes depending on the machine you play. The Left 4 Dead arcade cabinet was something I didn't get to play, but a friend of mine did, and they came back saying that they played through almost the entire mall campaign on just one coin, which is like almost 30 minutes! So this 500 yen coin that you end up with if you spend their lowest bill on something cheap could last you like two hours in an arcade if you know how to spend it right. To be fair though, that is an expectation you should bring to only the cheaper cabinets with more conventional control schemes. Left 4 Dead Arcade controls with just an analog stick and a razor mouse, which is a far cry from these ridiculous, and much more expensive to play, Gundam Battle Pods, which use a series of levers and switches, a panoramic projected display, and a subwoofer set to 11 to try its best to make you feel like you're in a rumbling robot cockpit. And I found that pretty darn fun. Are you ready to become a Gundam, George? I'm gonna be the best Gundam. I'm how does it play? Well, you circle strafe around Z-targeted opponents in an online team deathmatch. Of course! But that's just what I found at the McDonald's's of Japanese arcades, at the Akihabara strips of Taito game stations and Sega game centers, the places that all for some reason decide to have orange walls. But I really had the most fun a couple miles away at an artificial island called Odaiba that is packed with all these kitschy amusement centers. Like Sega's Joyopolis, which is what would happen if Hatsune Miku collaborated with Hulk Hogan to make a Chuck E. Cheese together. It's somehow both trashier and more high-tech at the same time. It's the only place I've ever seen with a roller coaster inside. So this is the place where you can find those urinal mini-games in the men's room where you have to pee on a target really good to win. And when I saw that, I knew. I knew this was happening. I knew I had to get footage of it somehow. It was... It was a busy day, there were people coming in and out, so I just kind of camped out in the stall. Because if I, a sweaty, dumb foreign tourist who doesn't know the language, ran out there with my camera in front of Japanese men minding their own business, there would be no explaining myself. Alright? So I waited. That place had to be clear. And there you have it. Video proof that urinal games exist somewhere in the world. What's easier to swallow were these tilting, swerving initial D cabinets made out of cars, which is really the end point of all racing video games. You can't evolve past this. This is the logical conclusion of every racing arcade simulation setup by hydraulically lifting an actual car in front of your video games and tossing you around in it. You're shifting your body weight against the weight of the actual car you're inside to keep your orientation as you drift corners. You feel this giant machine speed up and slow down underneath you as it shifts in and out of gears. You narrowly weave in between obstacles with an actual sense of the dimensions of your vehicle. And that level of physical involvement really steps things up a notch, which is neat. Except it gets even worse. You know... It's over. It's done. Video games are through. There, there's nothing left to make anymore. You know, I previously thought that that initial D cabinet they had one level lower was the logical conclusion of the racing video game. After all, you were in a racing car playing a video game about being in a racing car, simulating a racing car. But no, no, of course not. There's still the, the fictional aesthetic stuff to move forwards. The theme. Put it in the future. Have it happen on an F-Zero tubular racetrack where you go careening through space, spiraling the players around and loop-de-looping them. And, and, and where do you go from there? The only place to go is backwards. This thing is called Storm G. These pods actually seat two players with steering levers oriented vertically to one another. You both have to input the same turns for it to register, kind of like the bobsled minigame in Mario Party. Except you get bonuses for flipping the two of you upside down. This machine doubles as a change collector, so it's bad business that they play a warning video telling you to put all your loose coins in your bling away. 
But you know, I worry that what I enjoyed the most about Japanese arcades was not the authentic Japanese arcade experience. I mean, sure I was able to enjoy the foot traffic aspect to it, the, the convenient location next to train stations and how you just kind of walk up escalators and play what you want to play, but what I think killed arcades in the West was the same question I was wondering when seeing all of these rows of Tekken and Street Fighter in Japanese arcades. Why pay money to go out and play games that I could play at home for free? As it turns out, the answer is that it's an opportunity to play loud, rowdy video games with friends outside of your traditionally cramped and quiet Japanese home. Which is a problem I don't gotta deal with, so me, as a big dumb tourist, was looking for big dumb arcade games. Games that had large, immersive, unconventional cabinets, and that does actually kind of fall in line with the historical purpose arcades served in the West in the 90s, which was to play games or better versions of games that you could not play at home. Have you ever looked at that $800 HTC Vive set and wondered, gee, why don't they start up some arcades with these things? Well, guess what? Bandai Namco, not Namco Bandai, oh god. <laughs> ...is doing exactly that with a concept VR arcade in Odaiba, just across the street from Joyopolis. And what's going on here is a test trial for a variety of VR input methods and how they stack up against the profitability and overhead costs of a typical arcade. And what struck me was how a typical arcade cabinet is so much more of a set-it-and-forget-it enterprise than VR. The VR Zone Project ICANN, which is this place's actual name, is buzzing all over with staff, who have to carefully walk players through every single game. Between the two of us, me and my buddy played four of them. I didn't play this one, but was told that this Gundam thingamajig is kind of more of a VR movie than a game. I tried out their version of VR skiing, which did a good job of conveying the vertigo of sliding down a steep mountainside, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I should have been able to pizza with the foot pedals that are permanently stuck in french fry mode. They had a bloody hospital-themed horror game with totally not Silent Hill artwork that did a good job of spooking the crowd, but felt a little underwhelming to me for a couple reasons. In this one, you are strapped to a wheelchair controlled by a joystick, which is a clever way of mitigating the balance VR has to strike between restricting the player's limb movements and greatly liberating the player's head movements. I'm sorry, there's no footage of this game on the internet and there's no way I could capture it in person, so you just gotta use your imagination. You have a joystick on your wheelchair IRL that does go forwards, backwards, left and right, but once you're in the game, it only goes forwards, so it's kind of turning that concept of a VR turret shooter into a VR rail shooter, which in my book isn't a whole lot of progress. You're just kind of controlling the speed at which your little wheelchair man rides along that rail. You and a friend cooperatively press forward on your way through this haunted house, solving puzzles and getting spooked by monsters together. With all due respect, they did a fine job of making some basic co-op play out of this technology and this concept, but I just can't help but get nervously ticked by how many compromises developers keep making on player movement in VR games. I have played traditional first-person games in VR with the stick that you move with, and life went on, it was fine. I didn't experience any of the motion sickness or disorientation that you keep hearing developers talk about when they make these compromises, and, and I just really wish that a lot of VR games would look backwards and let you use WSAD or a stick to frickin' walk around. Just, just release one flagship game with that control scheme and see what happens. Just try it. Being able to freely move around a much bigger space is why you hear so many more positive impressions about room-scale VR compared to just the headsets acting alone. The addition of a couple motion-tracked armbands and slippers is all it takes to make all the difference in the world for a totally immersive experience. Bandai Namco's signature exhibit for this place is called Fear of Heights, a room-scale experience where the room is a wide-open city skyline atop a skyscraper and the objective is a stuffed cat. Your obstacle? A plastic plank that staffers occasionally shake underneath you. And that one got me. That one got me really good. And it's weird to think that that might have actually been the most amazing experience I had out of any of these uh, Japanese arcade-style business establishments. I wasn't convinced that I was at the top of a skyscraper balancing on a tiny little plank, but I did feel a terrifying, tiny, instinctive urge of self-preservation somewhere in the folds of my brain that really, really did not want to see what that fall looks like, even if it was just a game. Why am I doing this? 
so mad.